This morning we're starting on, uh, we're going to look at chapter 19 of the Confession of the Law of God. And I want to read Genesis 1 and verse 27 before we get started. Genesis, well let me start with verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. The image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And down in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. As we come to the law of God, we need to I have a, I want to back up just a second to see the big picture of our confession again as we start another little section. Uh, the first principles that we've covered are chapter 1 through chapter 6. The covenant is chapter 7 through 20, and now we're in chapter 19, and so that tells you we're about ready to finish up this portion of the confession. And in chapter 7 to 20, we have in chapters 10 through 13, the acts of God, that's God bringing salvation to man. And in chapter 14 through 18 is the acts of man, his response to God, but it also as we look at those things, we understand that the, these are graces that man receives from God, so he can believe, so he can repent, so he can be adopted and justified and the rest. And so then chapter 19 and 20 answers two crucial questions then. What about the law? And how does the law interact with the gospel? And then how does the spread of the gospel happen? Uh, when the Westminster Confession was published in 1646, chapter 20 was not part of the confession. And then when the uh, Puritans published the Savoy Declaration, or I'm sorry, the, Pres the, the Savoy Declaration by the Congregationalist Puritans, they added chapter 20 because they had a group of people called the, Pur called the Pilgrims who went to America. And the Church of England and the Presbyterians said, well, how are you going to start churches all the way over on the other side of the world without a direct uh, church government involvement? And so the answer in chapter 20 is how do you spread the gospel without the state doing so? And uh, we understand that there's a distinction between the realm of the church and the realm of the state. Both are divine institutions by God, yet they have different authorities. And uh, we're of the opinion as Baptists, of course, it's not the state's responsibility to share the gospel. That's the church's responsibility. And so then that's what chapter 20 answers. How do we spread the gospel? And then chapter 21 through 29 is talking about God-centered liberty, freedom, and boundaries. How is it that we live our life and, and how does the church operate? And then chapter 30 and 31 is the world to come. The fancy theological word there is eschatology, the study of last things. So then there's a couple approaches to the law. We need to have that in a frame of mind, a frame of reference to, to be able to compare what's being explained in the confession. Uh, one of the most blatant, I tried to use some obvious examples. So one is the Orthodox Jew. They believe that the Old Testament law is still binding. They don't believe the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They reject his work on the cross of Calvary. They live by the Old Testament. And then they have these books called the Talmud. There's the Babylonian, and then I think there's a Jerusalem. And I know the Babylonian Talmud is about 22 very thick volumes on how to live according to the law. I'm thankful for the gospel of grace. Uh, and so all the law is still applicable and to be obeyed. And then there's antinomian, antinomial, antinomialism. So it's made up of two Greek words, anti, which is against, or instead of, which is the Antichrist, he's against Christ, and then namos is law. So these are people who are anti or against law. And what they teach is that all the law has been done away with. When Christ died on the cross of Calvary, that was the end of the law. We don't even have to worry about the legal statutes anymore in the Old Testament. Now there's there's this, ish, this position and the next one that we're going to talk about has, suffers from the same problems. How do you order a just society? If the Old Testament law is done away with and it's no longer applicable, 
then how can we say what true morality looks like? And so we'll, we'll get into that here in a second. So then, then there's the next one is on our list is dispensational. And what they teach is that only laws repeated in the New Testament are applicable. So, for example, uh, and I don't want to, I hate to use like the most heinous thing, but if, a, if an adult had relations with a child in the Old Testament, that was an ex, ex, uh, executable offense. It was a capital crime. Well, in the state of Florida, so we're going to date our recording this morning, in the state of Florida, they just passed a law to make that, once again, an executable offense. And I praise the Lord for that. Uh, that now, you know, the most innocent among us will be protected by the most serious penalty available. But that's not repeated in the New Testament. So if you say only the laws that are in the Old Testament are brought forward in the New Testament are only applicable, then there's a whole bunch of stuff in the Old Testament that doesn't apply anymore. That we, We're going to have problems again, likewise, ordering our society. So how does this confession, how does the covenantal approach uh, apply this, then this theory of the law? What, they, what is taught in our confession here this morning is all laws are still applicable except laws expressly abrogated in the New Testament. Abrogated is the big fancy legal word for done away with. So for our great example in 1 Peter, Peter writes, he quotes in the, from the book of Leviticus, be ye holy for I am holy. And when you go to that passage in Leviticus, what do you find? That's the passage where all the, the laws are about what you can and can't eat. But yet Peter's up on the rooftop and he receives the vision where all the corners of the thing are let down and all the animals and the Lord says, rise, kill Peter and eat. And he says, oh no, Lord, I've never eaten anything that's unclean. And the Lord said, no, everything's, there's nothing unclean anymore. You can eat the bugs if you want. No, thank you. I'm not Lord willing. I don't have to come to that. But, but my point is, it's all clean now. God said it's clean. So the same apostle who received the vision about, about all unclean animals are now clean is the same one who quoted from that same passage in the Old Testament said, be holy for I am holy. So what we find then is anything unless it's expressly forbidden or, or expressly abrogated is still applicable. So we can, and this is going to be the teaching of the confession, is we can go to the Old Testament and look for the principles of a moral and just society and how we ought to live our lives to understand the holiness of God. Uh, and, and then we're also going to consider how that's related to the gospel. And so that answers then for us a lot of questions. How can I say that, that uh, crime X should be execute, executable offense? How can we know that that's a capital crime? Because the word of God says how do we know that this one only receives 39 stripes instead of the death penalty? Because the Word of God says so. Uh, and and we, so it takes a very careful study of those things. And I'll, I'm going to go out here on a limb and say that the Puritans have probably already done that somewhere. And uh, it's just a matter of finding the, which one did it. And uh, because they're very, they're very careful students of the Word of God and look for all those things. And and, uh, and our lesson this morning is just an overview. So we're not trying to get down and kick the ball down in the weeds and quibble over, does this verse apply today? And what's the, the breakdown of that? Because there's been a lot of squabble over this in the last 500 years. And so we're not going to be able to get into all the squabble today. I'm sure entire forests have been murdered by academics uh, disputing these things in the theological journals. The only thing that's saving trees today in the seminary is the computer. Uh, now it's all digital instead of being printed out on paper. Uh, so our approach then, that we're going to look in this confession again, is that unless it's been expressly revoked, done away with, or abrogated in some way by the command of the Lord or a New Testament writer, it's still applicable. So this is how we go from Sabbath being Saturday to Sunday being the day of worship. This is how we uh, are now allowed to eat bacon because it would be sad if we had to meet on Saturday and not have any bacon. But I'm glad that we can meet on Sunday and have bacon. 
and and I, I know I'm a little silly there with that, but the point is that unless the Lord has changed it, then we have to consider it still applicable. And the question is then how do we apply that? So, so on paragraph one, which we've read a couple of verses already, uh, we find God, we find the law of universal obedience. God gave to Adam a law of universal obedience written in his heart and a particular precept of not eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil by which he bound him and all his posterity to personal, entire, exact, and perpetual obedience, promised life upon the fulfilling and threatening death upon the breach of it, and endued him with the power and ability to keep it. So here we find the pro, we have this prohibition in Genesis chapter 2 and 17, don't eat of this tree, but also God gave a, a positive command, fill the, fill the earth, subdue the earth, have dominion, have lots of children, but yet they were still tied to that. So there's a universal obedience. God gave them the ability to obey his command. It wasn't that God, because God didn't create Adam sinful. He created him sinless. He had, uh, he had creature righteousness. Uh, he wasn't confirmed in that because he could fall and eat it by eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but he could have been confirmed had he ate by the tree of life by faith. If he had said, I'm not, I'm not eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God said not to do that, but I'm going to eat of the tree of life because that's what God said. And so, because Adam was our representative in the garden, now we are all subject to the same thing. But yet God gave him that ability. God wrote in his heart that law that he was supposed to obey. And then there were sanctions that were both good and bad. He said, he said if you keep it, you have life. If you break it, you have death. And, I, and one thing that I, I was, I've been doing some study on economics from a Christian perspective here lately is that typically we hear that when we hear the word sanction, we think of automatically something that's bad. Well, sanctions can be something that's good or bad. It just depends upon what the application of it. And so God sanctions these things. He said, if you eat of the tree of life, you have life. If you obey me, you have life. If you, eat of the, if you disobey, you have death. And so God does give sanctions, both positive and negative, in his scriptures. Do this and live, fail and die. And so in chapter 3 then, or I'm sorry, paragraph 2, we have the, the moral law. And notice with me in Romans chapter 2 and verse, uh, let's see, let, as we pass by here, uh, De Deuteronomy 10 and verse 4. He wrote on the tables according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount, of the midst of the fire and the day of the assembly and the Lord gave them unto me. And then Romans chapter 2 and verse 14 and 15. Romans chapter 2 verse 14 and 15. <coughs> For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contain the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So what about this moral law? Notice the same law that was first written in the heart of man continued to be a perfect rule of righteousness after the fall and was delivered by God upon Mount Sinai and Ten Commandments and written in two tab tables. The four first contained our duties toward God and the other six are duty to man. And so we find here that this law is still imprinted on man's heart. How is it that, according to Romans chapter 1, that man knows that God is? Because God has given it to us to know that God exists. He's placed that in every man. He's placed that in every person on this earth. And so when you talk to the atheist or the unregenerate, they're like, I don't believe God is. They're lying. They know deep down, down inside the bottom of their toes while they're pressing down on it that God is. Or they wouldn't fight against them. You don't think, I don't, I don't believe Santa Claus is real. I don't fight against Santa Claus. I just ignore him. He doesn't exist. Well, what does the ACLU do, right? Don't dare put a baby Jesus in a manger somewhere. They go berserk especially on the courthouse steps. Why? Because they hate God. 
because they know God exists. As far as I know, the ACLU doesn't sue over Santa Claus and Easter Bunny. I haven't, haven't run across any of those articles yet, but maybe they're out there. But in this, so the, the law of God is imprinted on man's heart. He knows what is moral and what's not. What happens is he sears his conscience. He destroys that knowledge in his own being, but yet it's still there. And then we find that God wrote it down. He, the, we have the imprint in the stone. God took with his very finger and wrote the Ten Commandments on the tablets, on the tables. And what did, and what did Moses do at the, at the golden calf incident? He threw them on the ground and broke them. The originals, the originals, he threw on the ground and broke them. And so the Ten Commandments that end up in the Ark of the Covenant are not the originals, but copies. Because God wrote it again. And God, God's copy was just as authoritative as just the same as it was the first time. What is the content of this law then? The first, they mention here two tables. Now this is classic Reformation understanding of the Ten Commandments. Uh, the first four our duties toward God and the last six are our duties toward man. And so when they talk, when you read the old writers, the Puritans, the old Baptists and the Presbyterians, you'll find they talk about the first table of the law and the second table of the law. And what they're talking about is that division of the laws. Now, I'm of the opinion that when God wrote down the Ten Commandments, all ten, were, he made two copies. What, ten went on one commandment, ten went on the other commandment, ten the same ten on another tablet because it, God was making a covenant with the, with the nation of Israel. And when you make a covenant, each party gets an exact copy of the covenant. And so when you purchase a house, the bank has a copy and you get a copy. So that way, if there's any funny business on the bank side, you can, you can take it and say, hey, look, right here, you broke this covenant. Of course, the bank, they're very meticulous. It's going to be hard for them to break the covenant, but uh, it'll be easy for us to do that. But in, but in that explanation of that, God had two, those two tables, two tablets that he put the uh, Ten Commandments on. And so the understanding, and I have no problem with it, this understanding the two tables law. The first four is our duties toward God, and the last six are duties toward man. And so what God did was he took those things that, imprinted, that he imprinted on Adam's heart, to keep and to obey. And he put them on stone so that way we could read them and have them. Just like he's given to us his word. God could imprint all his word on our heart. He could fill our head full of all, all everything we need to know and sometimes I'd love to have that. But the reality is God has given us something even better. He's given it to us in written form that, that, that we can't misremember it, that we can't misunderstand it, or we can misunderstand, but we, we have it in, uh, in front of us in written form. God speaks to us. And then everybody has the same copy. And so that way then, when somebody says, well, I think the Bible says this, you say, well, let's, let's go check that out. Let's, let's see what God says on the issue. Not going by what just somebody says they have in their head. So God has wrote those things down for us, and the con that's we find then the content of the law. And then what we have in paragraph three, four, and five this breakdown of the law. We have civil, we have, or rather we have ceremonial, civil, and moral. And this is again a classic threefold division of the law, going back to the time of Martin Luther. How is it that we understand law? Do we need to understand it as a category whole? And if we do that, that's where the antinomialists come along and say, see, it's all fulfilled, it's all done, it's all done away with, we don't need the Old Testament anymore. And I argue that that's not a good way to approach it. How is it that we can just throw away Genesis? How is it we can just throw away Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy? How is it we could throw away Joshua, uh, through Esther how is it we could throw away Isaiah through Malachi and the Psalms and Proverbs that, I think that'd be foolishness because if God speaks it's his law it's what he's given to us to understand 
And so then this threefold division then we see in this confession, first they cover the ceremonial law. Besides this law commonly called moral, and paragraph two is on the moral law, uh, God, God was pleased to give to the people of Israel ceremonial laws, contain several typical ordinances, partly of worship, prefiguring Christ, his graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits, and partly holding forth divers instructions of moral duties, all which ceremonial laws being appointed only to the time of reformation are by Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, and the only lawgiver who is furnished with the power and the, from the Father to, for that end abrogated and taken away. So over in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14, And then we'll go over to Hebrews real quick. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spooled principalities and powers, and made a show of them, openly triumphing over them. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are shadows of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you for your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels intruding into those things which have he hath not seen, vainly puffed up his fleshly mind. And over in Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 1, For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So what was the purpose of the ceremonial law? It was to point to Christ. The sacrifices, the tabernacle, the, all those things were to point to Christ. So when the offer, when the man came and offered a sacrifice, that sacrifice would not save him. The sacrifice would atone for his sin, but it, by faith he had to look forward to the coming of Christ, who is the one who would bring everlasting atonement. And so the sacrificial ritual itself couldn't save anybody. But it was by faith believing that Christ was coming. Abraham believed God. It was counted to him, imputed to him for righteousness. Yet Abraham still offered sacrifices. And so until Christ came, those things were a picture, a type, a prefiguring of Christ. And so when Christ came, then he abrogated the ceremonial law. That's why we don't bring sheep in here and slaughter them as a sacrifice. Or turtle doves. Or wheat. Or whatever. Why? Because that's all been done away with. I heard of a church one time, they decided, the pastor decided, that he was going to demonstrate what it was to sacrifice a lamb. And he decided to do it on a Sunday morning in a full congregation, and the FBI ended up coming by and seeing him. So I don't recommend it to start with. But two, we don't have to because we're not under those, or I shouldn't say, we are... Uh, those things have been done. The ceremonial law has been done away by Christ. So the next question then is what of the civil law? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 through 10. 1 Corinthians 9, and verse 8 through 10. Now, when we read this, you need to understand that Paul is quoting an Old Testament law. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 8. But I say these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes no doubt this is written, that he that plows should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of this hope. Now, so what do we find here then in our confession? To them he also gave sundry judicial laws which expired together with the state of that people, not obliging any now by, the, by virtue of that institution, their general equity only being of moral use. So what we have is, what is, a, what is civil law? It's related to the nation state. 
So God said, I'm, I'm creating the state of Israel, the nation of Israel, and these are your civil laws. Now, what was the nation of Israel supposed to do with that body of law? They're to take that body of law to other nations and teach them what God has said. But when the nation of Israel expired and ceased to exist, so did the civil law. How can you enforce a law when there's no government power behind it to enforce it? The United States of America ceased to exist tomorrow. No one's coming around to enforce the IRS regulations because the IRS will no longer exist. Without a nation state, there's no civil law, which is a scary thing when people want rebellion and anarchy. But the reality is when the ceasing of the nation state of Israel, that ended that civil law. But what do we find that also the confession explains? As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 9, for is it written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth, doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? And notice again what the confession said. Their general equity only being of moral use. So while, as far as I know in America, there's no law, or there might be, that it says you can't muzzle the ox while you tread corn. Uh, while, you, while you thresh the wheat. However though, when we look at that, when we come to these laws in the Old Testament that God has given the nation of Israel, we can say, what is the principle behind this? And the principle that Paul was driving at in 1 Corinthians 9 was that those who labor are worthy of the reward of their labor. That ox, he's going around, God told them that he could eat whatever he wanted to while he was going around treading the corn. And, God, and what Paul says then is the man who labors and works is worthy of his reward. Now in the context of 1 Corinthians 9, he's also talking about that of spiritual uh, work, that of the ministry. But we can go to the Old Testament and can say, all right, God said do this and don't do that. And that's a civil law for the nation of Israel. But how can we take that principle and apply it? How can we understand that principle that works in the nation that we live in. How can we apply that to where we live? And by the way, you don't have to have a law on the books that says you can't muzzle an ox. If you've got an ox and you're treading and you're threshing grain like that, then you can go to the Old Testament and say, you know, God said that he wants me to take care of my ox while I'm out here plowing or while I'm out here threshing wheat or while I'm out doing these other activities that, that God does care for this lowly beast that he's given me. So there's principles that we can begin to build upon. But then also we can, as a nation state, say, what, what has God said on these issues? And then we could enact similar laws tailored to our situation uh, and our conditions that we have. Because it's the principle that we're now driving at. And so there's nothing wrong with, the, with having politicians who say, maybe more of a politician at that point, it'd be more of a statesman type, and say, look, this is what God said, and this is the way, and we know that, that we want to honor God, and so we want to have these same similar kind of laws in our nation that honor God. And, uh, of course, certain groups of our country, with their heads would explode, and, uh, and it'd be on the nightly news. So, the answer then for the, ceremony, uh, for the civil law is, the civil law is no longer binding because we're not Israelites living in the land of Israel. But it is principles for us that we can order our lives by and if, uh, if we have the ability to, that we can order society after as a pattern. Then we can find in paragraph 5 then the duration of the moral law and uh, Romans chapter uh, 13 let's let's see let's read Romans 3 and verse 31 Romans 3 and verse 31 Paul says do we then make void the law through faith God forbid yea we establish the law 
So in paragraph 5, the moral law doth forever bind all, as well justified persons as others, to the obedience thereof, and not that only in regard of the matter contained in it, but also in respect of the authority of God the Creator who gave it, neither doth Christ in the gospel any way dissolve but much strengthen this obligation. So what do we find then about the moral law? Well, everyone is bound by the moral law, the Ten Commandments. And by the way, all 615 commandments, or 600 and I guess it'd be 605 or 603 because the Ten Commandments would count as part of that, all of them fit under one of those Ten Commandments, every single one of them. And so the basis of God's judicial, ceremonial, and moral laws that he gives the nation of Israel all flow out of the Ten Commandments. They're expositions, if you could put it this way, of explaining how this works. What does it mean to worship the Lord thy God? Well, you're going to have a tabernacle and you're going to have certain rituals and do all these things. So all these commandments that we find, they all fall under one of those ten heads. There's no escaping it. But yet God gave to us the moral law, even with the creation of Adam in the garden. Because Adam couldn't keep one law and those that were already given to him, then it expanded from there. Why? Because there's no end of man's depravity. People say, well, all God says, you can't do this and you can't do that. Right, because man always tends to do evil. You know, I, I tell my children no more than I ever have said yes. And they're not terribly evil, but they have Adam's depraved nature. And so I tell, I tell them that they're uh, terribly cute and terribly normal. So what we find then, God has to tell us no. He tells us no to a lot of things because we run toward harmful behavior because of our sinful nature. And so when we find that then is everyone is bound to the moral law, but the moral law is strengthened by Christ. If you, all you have to do is go over to the Sermon on the Mount and, and the Lord says, if it is written, thou shalt not, thou shalt not murder. And then he, what does he say? To hate your brother is to murder him. So, God, so Christ on the Sermon on the Mount, he doesn't lower the standards concerning the law. He raises the standards concerning the law. He takes it from an outward restraining activity and, re, and takes it to an inward restraining activity. Because it's only the Holy Spirit that's the one who's able for us to live that way. And then we find the uses of the moral law. Now I know this is on the on next page over. That's our longest, it's also the longest paragraph in this uh, chapter. And so we find here, let's see, Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. Romans 6 and verse 14. For shall sin have dominion over you? For ye are not under the law, but under grace. And then Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Paul again writes, knowing that a man is not justified by the works law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, for the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So now we've just spent five paragraphs explaining that God's given to us a law or to be obedient to that law, that God gave the moral law to everybody, but there was civil and ceremonial laws that God gave to the nation of Israel and that we can apply the civil laws in the realm of this nation state and in our own lives to learn about the holiness of God and learn about who the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. And so then the question is, what is the right uses of the law? Because there are some wrong uses, but we want to focus on the right uses. And so we find here in paragraph six, although I'm going to read the first sentence and then we'll read the second sentence. This is the only paragraph so far we've had. I actually had two sentences in the same paragraph. Paragraph six starts with, although true believers be not under the law as a covenant of works. Remember, we have to think back to what what what's been said earlier about the covenant of works to be therefore justified or condemned yet is of great use to them as well as to others and that as a rule of life informing them of the will of God and their duty it directs and binds them to walk accordingly 
discovering also the sinful pollutions of their natures, hearts, and lives, so as examining themselves thereby, they may come to further conviction of humil humiliation for and hatred against sin, together with a clear sight of the need they have of Christ and the perfection of his obedience. It is likewise to you of use to the regenerate to restrain their corruptions in that it forbids sin and threatenings of it. So, excuse me, let me back up. It is likewise of use to the regenerate to, uh, to restrain their corruptions and that it forbids sin and the threatenings of it severe to show what their sins deserves and what afflictions in this life they may expect for them, although freed from the curse and unallied rigor thereof. And so we find here that, first of all, the believer in the law, I'm not justified by the law. And remember the covenant of works, that's what, that's what we all live under because of Adam's sin in the garden. God said, don't eat of the tree. He ate of the tree. He broke that covenant. We're all going to die because of that covenant of works. And what happens is some claim that the Mosaic law is a covenant of works. And if you keep the law, you can go to heaven. Uh, the Jews are ones that teach that, for example, the Orthodox Jews. However, though, the believer is not no longer condemned under that law, but we're now justified because Christ died for us and he regenerated us. So I no longer live in terror to the law. The law now is an aid to me. I'm no longer condemned by the law because Christ took my condemnation. So I'm freed from that condemnation, but now I can go to the law and see how I ought to live because now I have the Holy Spirit residing in me. And we find that the believers use the laws of God, its rule of life, teaches us the will of God and duties to God. What is it that God says, be ye holy for I am holy? Well, you can read all the book of Leviticus and find that out. How about our, in our, also our walk with God? The believer also has the use of the law as a guard. We can self-examine ourselves. What does God say about these things? You know, the Old Testament speaks authoritatively on the same as the New. It, teaches, it helps us with conviction of sin in our own life and produces humility. When we read about those things in the Old Testament law and we see what Christ has done for us, it ought to cause us to be humble about it, not boastful and proud. And there's some who are seem to be very proud of the fact that, well, I, I did what had to be done so I could be saved. And that's not the truth in reality. Christ has done all that was necessary, but also pr promotes hatred of sin. I know that hate, people are like, oh, you shouldn't be hateful, which I agree. There's, there's many uses of the word hate, just like there is anything else. But we ought to have a hatred of sin. Sin in our society, but, but also sin in ourselves. To realize that we're, we're tainted with the filth of this world because we live here. We have this flesh that we indwell. But also then it helps the believer, to, the believer uses the law to remember the, their great need. We study the Old Testament law and we see they had to bring this sacrifice and bring that sacrifice and God said do this and God said don't do that and, and, we, and we begin to appreciate the great need that we have of a Savior to, to be able to deliver us from all those things. And then I realized the typo is a, uh, in my outline here. Notice uh, it says there in the confession is likewise used to the regenerate to restrain their corruptions and that it forbids sin. Now, I realize in my outline here, I have the believer uses the law. Uh, the believer, u the believer uses, uses the law and the unregenerate. And so that needs to be changed to, changed to the idea of being regenerate. And so what does it, how, how does this work then for the believer in a study of the law? What's well, to restrain our own sin? Because as we learn the Word of God and study the Word of God, we get the Word of God in us. The Holy Spirit then has something to work with. And He reminds us of our sin and restrains us because then the, that Bible verse comes to, comes to mind. And we go, oh, I, I'm not supposed to do that because God said so. Well, that restrains us from, our, from sin. It demonstrates to us the terribleness of our sin. 
uh, to teach us of the judgment to come. You know, we ought to live with the end in mind that one day we will stand before God and give an account. But also it teaches us of the gra of grace. And again, I see I have that typo again. Uh, teach us of grace to the, the regenerate. Uh, though we are free from the law, and the fact that we're no longer condemned to it, it should remind us of the grace that we enjoy. Because God says that those, if you don't keep the law, you're condemned by the law. And then as we study law, we go, oh, there's that, and oh, and this too, and oh, look at that area in my life here, and oh, look at this too that I have problems with, and on and on and on the list goes, which cry, causes us to cry out with, thank you for your grace and for your mercy. And we finally find the blessing of the law in paragraph, uh, in, in the second sentence, he said, the confession says, the promise of it likewise show them that God's appro appropriation of obedience and what blessings may they may expect upon the performance thereof, though not as due to them by the law as a covenant of work, so as a man's doing good and refraining from evil, because the law encourageth to the one and deterreth from the other, is no evidence as being under the law, but under grace. And again, Galatians 2 and verse 16, as we read it earlier, knowing that a man is not justified by the works law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even as we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, but by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So under the, so what is the blessing of the Christian then with the law? God approves of obedience. That's what approbation means, is approval. So if we order our lives according to the law, we look for the principles that God puts in there. We follow the moral teachings. We uh, honor what God has told us to do. God blesses us for that. Why? Because we're living according to his word. But then what else do we find? Well, uh, that God, I should, God, uh, I got ahead of myself a little bit. God approves of our obedience to his law. You realize that we can never be too holy in this life. Why? Because one, we're, we're, on our, uh, we're totally depraved in our unregenerate state. We're as far away from God as we can be. And when God saves us, he sanctifies us and draws us, he draws us to, herself, us to himself, he sanctifies us, he justifies us, adopts us. And, now, and, and the end goal of all that is that we're going to be just like the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm way way over here. I have a long ways to go before I even get to that place. But how can I learn about the holiness of God? Through the Old Testament law. If I obey those principles and precepts, God approves of that. Why? Because I have a long ways to on this journey of sanctification to go. But also we find there's a blessing because he blesses obedience. Notice he sa it says there, So as man's doing good and refraining from evil, because the law encourageth to the one and deterreth from the other, is no evidence of his being under the law, but under grace. Why is it then that I'm living this way? It's because I'm going to heaven. Why is it I'm concerned about having a holy life? It's because I'm going to heaven. Not because I'm trying to get there, but I'm already on my way. So our goal ought to be then is to live as if I'm going to heaven. To live as that reality. And God blesses our obedience. The more we obey God, the more we follow God's word, the more pleased God will be with us. Now, obviously, we're just as holy and justified as we'll ever be because those, there's some things that are positional. You can't can't improve upon it but yet we're in this world and there's that progress of sanctification and so if we walk with God we can have his blessing upon our lives and by the way we talk about the blessings of God we're not talking about health wealth and prosperity we're talking about him just being pleased with us because Paul was very obedient to the word of God and obedient to Christ and where was he he was shipwrecked he was beaten he was in prison 
but yet he could praise God for all his wonderful care and blessing. And so we have to keep all those things in frame. But remember that what Christ said, lay not, lay not up treasure on earth where rust and moth doth corrupt, but in heaven. And so there's a, if we believe that this life is all that there is, and we're saying, well, we're going to have all God's blessing now, then what are we going to have when we get to the other side? We have to put something up for the other side. And so not all, not, we may not see all the blessing on this side. We have to keep that in mind and keep the big picture. And then lastly, in paragraph 7, we have the law and the gospel. Galatians 3 and verse 21. Galatians 3 and verse 20, uh, 21. The Bible says, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there be, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. And then over in Ezekiel 36 and verse 27, Ezekiel 36 and verse 27. We have this great promise given to us. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So we find them in the law and the gospel. Neither are the aforementioned uses of the law contrary to the grace of the gospel, but do sweetly comply with it. The spirit of Christ subduing, enabling the will of man to do that freely and cheerfully which the will of God revealed in the law requireth to be done. So the law of God is not contrary, but complementary to the gospel. When Peter says, be ye holy as I am holy, we can go back to the Old Testament and say, what does it mean when God says, I am holy? What does it mean how I am to live my life a certain way that brings holiness and blessing? And so the law of God is not contrary to the gospel but complementary for the Christian. And notice it's the Holy Ghost that enables, and we talk about the Holy Ghost, he says there, the Spirit of Christ subduing, enabling the will of man to do that freely and cheerfully which the will of God revealed in the law requireth to be done. Why is it then that I want to do these things and live a holy life and follow the Word of God, even the Old Testament law? Because Christ has made all the difference. Christ has made all the difference. And now I can live a holy life, not because of my own ability, but by the power of the Holy Ghost who enables me and helps me to do those things. And this is the wonderful thing about the Gospel. God didn't bark down from heaven and say, you're going to do this or else. Now figure it out. No, in the garden... God gave Adam the ability to keep his commandment. And now, even as God's people being regenerated, God doesn't say to us, you're going to have to do this or, or else. He said, I'm going to send you my spirit. I'm going to give you the Holy Ghost to enable you to live the Christian life. And so if there's any failing, it's not on God's part. The failure then is on our part. Not not using that which God has given to us. The power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And it's a wonderful thing we have to keep in mind that the Holy Spirit and the Word of God also are not contrary to each other. There's some churches out there, some groups of people who claim that, that God works apart from His Word or that God can work apart from His Word. No, God is bound to His Word because God has put that relationship together because Christ is the Word of God. And so God cannot, God will not work apart from His Word because He's declared these things. So I can come to the Word of God and study the Word of God, learn from the Holy Spirit, and apply them in, and, and employ them in my life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that gives us great joy in our life. Because see, if we try to check the blocks and don't do this and do this because... Uh, all in our own power, we will be people most miserable. Because the flesh hates those kinds of things. And the flesh rebels against the Spirit anyway. But the Spirit's one enables us to keep His law in love. 
Christ saved me. Christ redeemed me. And therefore, to reciprocate that love, I want to be obedient to what God has said. And by the way, we may not see all the fruits of that obedience in this lifetime. Little children, as they come up being raised in home, they don't, they don't see all the fruit of obedience when they're little children. But when they become adults and they get out in the world, they go, oh, I'm thankful my parents disciplined me. I did tell my, my parents one day after I left home and was in the army, I'd come home and I said, you know, thank you. Thank you for all the board meetings I had as a child. You probably should have gave me a few more, but thank you. Because I've seen what happens when other people didn't receive that care and love and discipline from their parents. And see, the Holy Spirit's what enables us to live this life by His power.